It's finally time to pour one out for one of the most successful product lines ever in the history of PC gaming. AMD's AM4 platform gave us everything we could have wanted and then some. And Team Red kept almost every promise that they made along the way. We were able to use the same socket for over five years as the Ryzen 1700X was launched at the beginning of March 2017. Memory compatibility, at first a real concern, was improved for every subsequent release and sometimes mid-cycle through AGISA updates. AMD improved their performance in Adobe applications year over year to the point where the 5900X and the 5950X are now standard equipment in a lot of professional machines instead of recent Intel releases. The chiplet slash infinity fabric tandem got better as the process node shrunk from 14 nanometers down to seven nanometers and efficiency increased. And of course, AMD currently sits at the pinnacle of gaming performance due to the 3D vCache on the 5800X 3D. But just like my hopes and dreams of becoming a professional ASMR streamer, all good things must come to an end. And just like that, AM4 is no more. But AMD isn't leaving us hanging, and today I'm finally allowed to talk to you all about the new Zen 4-based CPUs, the AM5 socket, and the Ryzen 7000 series of processors. Let's get right down to it. No time wasted here, we're gonna jump right into the meat of it. AMD's product sampling this time around was a bit delayed, and while I've had the 7600X and 7700X for about two weeks now, my 7900X and 7950X samples were shipped Friday and arrive uh, well in about three hours from the time this video goes up. So for this video, we're just gonna be discussing the two lower end processors that are releasing today, which I don't actually mind. I think the vast majority of consumers are perfectly content to hang out in the mid-range, which is where the 6-core 7600X and the 8-core 7700X hang out. Here's a chart of the processors that go on sale today, starting at the top end of the stack with the $700 7950X and $550 7900X. The entire product line sports some familiar core and thread count configurations, as this is what we've been seeing ever since Ryzen 3000 series. So on paper, this might seem like the same old, same old, but that couldn't be further from the truth. For starters, the new processors are more power efficient due to the manufacturing node shrinking once again to five nanometers. This means less space between transistors. Pretend this is a transistor size apparently, and subsequently less power required for them to work together. We also have higher clock speeds across the board, and in my testing, I regularly saw speeds of 5200 to 5300 megahertz during heavy and sustained loads. The Zen 4 line also sports integrated RDNA graphics, meaning that you now don't need a graphics card at all to get your system up and running. We'll be exploring just how powerful these, these iGPUs are in an upcoming video, so be sure to get subscribed so you don't miss it. And Oh yeah, we have a completely new socket. AMD has moved away from the PGA or pin grid array design and to an LGA or land grid array construction moving forward. In practical terms, this means that the CPUs themselves are much more difficult to damage when handling or shipping as there are no pins to be bent or broken. However, just be careful when inserting them into the new LGA 1718 socket as those pins are very delicate. The good news here is that even though there is a completely new socket, AMD has managed to keep the same footprint for the chip. And as such, the cooler mounting mechanism remains exactly the same. All of your old coolers that had support for AM4 CPUs will also work just fine here. And in fact, for my testing, I used a Be Quiet 280 millimeter all-in-one cooler that I've had for a few years now. AM5 does make a change in the memory department, however, as you will need DDR5 instead of DDR4. DDR4 had a solid seven year run, but DDR5 provides significant improvements in speed and bandwidth. Prices on DDR5 kits have also come way down since the release of Intel's Alder Lake about a year ago, and they are readily available on the market. For today's testing, I used a two x 16 gigabyte kit of DDR5 6000 speed memory from G-Skill on the AM5 and Intel platforms and a two x 16 gigabyte kit of Corsair DDR4 3600 for all AMD AM4 CPUs. 
AMD sent over the new ASRock X670E Tai Chi. So that's what we're gonna be using here. And all Intel tests were run on a Z690 formula and the AMD 5000 chips were home in a Gigabyte X570 Aorus Master. In order to keep things fair and place as much load onto the CPUs as possible, all tests were run using an EVGA RIP RTX 3090 Ti, which is at least for the next few weeks, the fastest consumer GPU that you can buy. Now let's get to the section that you all probably skipped to anyway, the benchmarks. First, here is a snapshot of the power usage of our test subjects. You can see that the Intel processors still suck up the most wattage by far, but the new 7600X and 7700X are more power hungry than their predecessors. They're both still in the realm of being able to be cooled by a tower air cooler if you really want but especially the 7700X would probably be more at home with an AIO. Even using a 280 millimeter cooler, I saw temps around 90 C under heavy loads for this chip. And while your cooling solution and case configuration will certainly influence those results, just be aware that you might need a beefier cooling solution than last generation. Next, we can talk about synthetic benchmarks and overall CPU performance. Plainly stated, Zen 4 boasts incredibly impressive single core performance overall. Versus even the top end AM4 chips in 3 Mark's new CPU test, the 7600X and 7700X were in a different class. This really speaks to the IPC gains that AMD has been touting generation over generation. Both of the new chips even outperformed the 12900K, which was the previous leader in this category. Moving over to another single core test for validation, we can see similar results in the Cinebench R23 single core metric. The 7700X here even broke 2000 points, which is the first time that I've ever seen that happen in a stock CPU. The 7900X and 7950X are expected to exceed this single core performance, but for that, I'll just have to wait and see. Now let's circle back and see how that lead in single core translates to multi-core muscle. The 7600X and 7700X do fairly well here, holding their own against much more powerful processors in the 5800X 3D and 5900X. For a good point of comparison, take a look at the 5600X score versus the 7600X with the same core and thread configuration. Cinebench R23 multi-core is up next, and we see the 7700X coming within spitting distance of the 5900X. I'm not sure why you would spit on one, but that's, we're not gonna talk about that now. While Intel maintains a significant lead here, the fact is that there seems to be a good scaling between six and eight cores for AMD, and the 7950X will likely be a Cinebench monster as a result. Handbrake is a program that I use all the time for video transcoding, and it provides a good repeatable benchmark for CPU performance as none of the work is offloaded to the GPU. I took a 14 minute MP4 file and transcoded it to 1080p M4V. And while Intel still does lead here, you can see what kind of improvements AMD has made in this arena. The data here is time in seconds with lower being better. And the 7700X comes pretty close to the 12700K. Adobe Premiere, although sometimes it is the bane of my existence, it's still a tool that I use almost daily. Puget Systems has come up with a way to leverage Premiere and generate a score that represents how well a CPU will do in things like timeline scrubbing and processing adjustment layers and transitions. While still not quite on the level of Intel here, the 7600X and 7700X provide measurable improvements over previous generation AMD hardware, and Premiere has historically favored Intel CPUs anyway. And the last non-gaming benchmark we'll touch on is 7-zip decompression, with the 7700X almost taking the crown here and also beating out the 12-core 5900X. Now it's time to talk gaming. When discussing CPU performance in games, the best way to generate comparative data is to run the games in such a way that they are not bound by the power of your GPU. How do you do that? Well, by running them at relatively low resolution and detail settings. All of today's gaming tests were run at 1080p and low detail. There were no fancy eye candy features, ray tracing, or DLSS used. Dirt 5 kicked things off here, a game which I've played uh, maybe a few times when on my racing sim when I need a break from F122. While the 12900K is still tops in our testing, even the 7600X beats out all the previous generation AMD chips, and both it and the 7700X put up a great showing. I've played Borderlands 3 for a grand total of about 37 minutes, but that doesn't stop me from including the benchmark here. AMD comes out way ahead, and you can really see the power of that single core performance shining through. Even the tremendously fast 5800X 3D is no match for the new kids on the block, and Intel is far behind. 
Far Cry 6 is one of my favorite current shooters and I've logged some hours on this one. The 5800X 3D is actually the top of this chart, but the 7700X is only two frames per second behind and the 7600X has a fantastic showing, beating out both Intel CPUs. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is an AMD sponsored title, but that's more on the GPU side of things. As far as CPUs go, it was actually all very close here without much variation across the board. The 7600X did still put up the overall top score. F122 is my current obsession and the game looks gorgeous even at 1080p. We see the Zen 4 processors top the charts here, beating out even the 5800X 3D by significant margins. I was surprised to see Intel lag behind by this much, but all gaming tests are validated by averaging three runs, so this likely is a correct result. Red Dead Redemption 2 was on tap next using the built-in benchmark, and much like Assassin's Creed, we see parity across the board, with the exception of the 5600X dragging its heels a little bit. The 5800X 3D was tops, but at 160 frames per second, both the 7600X and the 7700X were less than 2% behind. Guardians of the Galaxy was the last gaming test that I ran, and there was a huge spread in the results here. The 12900K topped this chart with the 5800X 3D and 7700X not far behind. But look at the difference between the 7600X and 5600X. The 7600X is a full 40% faster here. Our testing isn't done, however. I decided that I wanted to see how well these chips could multitask. And the most prevalent multitasking combination in today's gaming and streaming environment is gaming while recording using OBS on a single system. I set up each of our games to run their benchmarks while OBS is recording at 1080p in the background. And here are the results. I'm gonna run through each of these slides quickly to get the overall end result. But feel free to pause at any time to see how OBS recording influences gameplay performance. In most cases, the effect was relatively small, but there were a couple of cases where the deficit was 10% or more. Here's a chart showing performance lost while recording gameplay. I was slightly surprised to see that the 7600X and 7700X were actually the worst at this, as I figured especially the 7700X with its 8-core 16-thread configuration would do better than the 5600X, but in fact it just didn't. It's worth watching to see if this can be improved in a future update of either OBS or the AMD Agisa. And that's a wrap on part one of our AMD Ryzen 7000 series coverage. Stay tuned for more on the 7900X and 7950X. I'm also planning on exploring the performance of RDNA iGPUs and seeing what effect overclocking has on performance scaling. Overall, I come away from this testing extremely impressed by AMD's latest. When Zen first launched, it was plagued by issues. You could tell there was a solid product underneath, but it took a while to uncover it. This time around, there doesn't really appear to be any growing pains when migrating to a new socket, a new manufacturing process, and a new architecture. Zen 4, simply put, looks to be a fantastic value for gaming with impressive, if not chart-topping, productivity chops as well. Considering that AM5 will be around for years to come, it might be worth jumping on the bandwagon right out of the gate. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Please remember to hit that like button on your way out, and I will see you next time.